Hi, I'm Jim and I'm the youth pastor at Forest Brook Community Church. And I want to welcome you to our very first youth ministry podcast. We thought this would be a great and exciting way to encourage you and invite you to consider what God is doing in our youth ministry and to communicate where we believe him to be leading us over the next several years. Our youth ministry is led by a group of men and women who we call our youth leadership group. They are a group that are deeply committed to seeing our youth uh, become faithful followers of Jesus and people who pour into the community. And every five years, we take time to re-envision youth ministry and make sure that we are headed the right way given the trends and the rhythms that we see around us. It's during this time that we strategize the goals and the plans for the next five to seven years. Now, right before the pandemic hit, we sat down to consider what the next five to seven years would look like. We came across a book called Faith for Exiles, written by David Kinneman. David is the president of the Barna Research Group. And in this book, he talks about the change in landscape. He calls it the digital Babylon. It's this fast paced information at your fingertips, always connected digital age that affects how we are formed. And this is the context where disciples are to be made. And he highlights five important shifts that can help this youth generation become more faithful disciples. Our youth leadership group commissioned a group of individuals whom you'll meet in this episode to take an in-depth look at these five shifts and really how they could shape the next five to seven years of youth ministry. We've chosen to present our findings and our vision over the course of this six part podcast because we would love to have the dialogue with you as you listen and engage. We truly believe that this is a communal effort and having the support and engagement of our community is the strength that we value. In the five podcasts following, we'll take a look at each of the concepts and how they relate to us making resilient disciples in this current age. We'll be joined by several guests who speak into some of the challenges, but also the opportunities that are presented as we look forward to what youth ministry can look like. I truly believe that right now is an opportune moment to re-envision what youth ministry looks like moving forward. The world is re-emerging from a collectively difficult period of time. And while our digital landscape is here to stay, the call to make resilient disciples still stands. So I invite you to tune in, engage, and connect with us over the things that you hear. Enjoy. Thanks again for uh, for joining me, Andrew. I think one of the things that uh, we're looking forward to is just fleshing out some of these concepts that are in this book, but also how it relates to Forcebrook and our youth moving forward for the next few years. When you read this, when you read, you know, when we were part of reading this thing, what, what did you think about it? And, you know, and from your perspective, what were some of the things that you really thought were important to take note of? Yes, thanks for having me, Jim. Um, so I think, I think the one thing that really stuck out to me when I read this as a whole was the idea that our youth group, as we currently are constituted, we do a lot of things really well. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence of that in our church. A lot of people that grew up in the church and went through our youth program um, that have done things like Jamaica, been on, uh, been consistent at small groups and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of really great stuff we do. But part of what the book pointed out to me was sort of this idea that we can be more intentional about the type of Christians that we want to cultivate at Forest Brook. What kind of things as young people can we really learn um, sort of like what muscles do you want them to develop in their faith journey? And mm -hmm. there's some stuff that when we read this book, I think all four of us sort of came, came away thinking we do that really well. Like we do it really well. We can see where it happens at our church, but maybe it's not, you know, it's not a, in the plan. It's not what we're going for. Um, yeah. But I think the book sort of pointed out to me that we have an opportunity to be more intentional about that kind of stuff. Um, which is exciting. Like it's exciting to sort of have a North star that we can shoot for. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the things that stood out to me in the book. What, what are some of the things that we, we, when we looked at it, you know, stood out to you in terms of, Hey, we got to pay attention to these things. Um, you know, I, I wonder if you could flesh some of that out for us. Yeah. So, so in their research, one of the interesting things they did is they sort of split those specifically who grew up in church. So that's the cohort that they're studying. They're not studying all Christians. They're not studying, you know, all of all the population of the United States in their case. They're just studying the people who grew up in the church and they separate um, people that have left youth, young people um, into four separate categories in terms of how they interact with the church, 
you know, into their young adulthood, into adulthood. And so they have, they have four different categories and then they'll, they sort of assign a percentage to which percent of those people that grow, grew up in the church fall into with each category. So the first would be the prodigals, which is the ex-Christians. Um, these individuals don't currently define themselves as Christians, despite being brought up in the church. That makes up about 22%. Nomads, um, which, which would be people who identify as Christians, but have not been involved with the church in the past month. And most of this group hasn't been involved with the church within the past six months. These ones are a bit funny reading now in the pandemic because none of us have uh, walked in the church in the last six months. So <laughs> whether you've uh, been actively following online or not, you sort of fall into uh, one of That's these because you haven't you haven't walked into the church. But I think uh, you understand the uh, the spirit of the definitions here. Um, so that group of people who um, would identify as Christians but aren't actively involved in the church in the past month or six months. That would be about 30% of the people that grew up in the church. Then you have habitual churchgoers. Those, those who have attended church in the past month, they're, they're constant, they're there, you recognize their face, um, but they don't hold the core beliefs or associated behaviors of being an, a, an intentional engaged disciple. Um, that would be about 38% of those who grew up in the church. And then when I was just taught, when we were talking there before about sort of the North Star, what, what are the people that we're hoping that our youth group can cultivate the most is resilient disciples. Um, and so that makes about 10% of the people that grew up in the church and the four, four attributes of the, of a resilient disciple that they outline in the book are number one, they attend church at least monthly and engage in church outside of worship. So that a good example of that would be small groups. So people that are at church, they come to small group on Tuesdays to do another thing around church. Maybe they're on a committee but you see them most Sundays and uh, they're involved beyond that. Uh, two, they trust in the authority of the Bible. Number three, they're committed to Jesus personally and believe he died on the cross for their sins. And number four, they have a desire to transform the community and the broader society as an outcome of their faith. So those are the four different um, categories that the books lined out. Um, in your experience as the, as the youth leader at Forest Brook hmm. um, for many years now, would you sort of feel like those same statistics apply to our youth group, to our young people? It, it ebbs and it flows, right? But I think yeah. um, I would say that these numbers are couched within uh, a really accurate bracketing. Um, yeah. I, 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 you, I, wouldn't, I couldn't tell you that, you know, 22% yeah. of all the young adults now uh, in the last 10 years fit in the section of the prodigals or whatever. But if you, if you were to look at um, generally people who, uh, who have been participating in, in, in faith communities and in their own communities, I would say that these numbers are fairly accurate. And one of the things I was going to say, uh, as you're sharing about this, about resilient disciples is that our, what, what excited me when we read this book together um, was that our goal had always been that uh, we wanted to look towards the future as, as you said, the North Star being those resilient disciples and moving all of our youth in every which way and with every different way to enter that stream to, to find um, that expression of being a, becoming a resilient disciple. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I think to me, I'm not, uh, to me, one of the things I think it can be easy to, to think about is that because those numbers are so low, because it's a 10% thing that it's discouraging. Like, why would you chase yeah. after that? Yeah. But I actually think the opposite. I think that it's, it's, as you said, it, it gives us something sharpened to focus on and say, yeah, this is the reason why we do X, Y, and Z, because yeah. this is what we're chasing after. So I, yeah. I think that right now is an incredibly opportune moment to retool ourselves. Um, for that so yeah and i also think the other thing to keep in mind when like when we're sort of bringing up some of these categories of of people mm -hmm. i hope it doesn't come across as a right. scorecard a, a scorecard on Absolutely. how you are as a christian or a scorecard on how, mm -hmm. how you are as a community member at forestbrook we really don't yeah. want to see it that way and even some yeah. of these categorizations are like they're using them for their research to sort right. of get a sense of what are people looking like? But I just, I don't want the uh, yeah. parents listening out there thinking that we're keeping a scorecard on how no. often our uh, kids are at youth group or how often they show up to youth. But 
I think it's helpful just to know in the current context of where we are in the world and where we are mm. in the, in Christianity, where is that leading most young people when they leave church after, you know, they've moved on from high school, they're out of their parents' house, where are they ending up? And yeah. focusing, like you said, on that 10% to sort of say, you know, it's pretty cool that we've got that 10% there. And they, they have these attributes that make them stick around, that make them a really positive part of our community. Mm -hmm. um, and how can we, how can we encourage more people to follow that path? So we bring that up as context because it was in the yeah. book. Um, but I hope it doesn't, I hope no. it's not a discouragement. Um, and in, in terms of sort of putting people of buckets as how often they're showing up, I think that's more of a, how are they using the statistics to sort of, you know, present a picture, yeah. which I think is helpful, but it's limiting in terms of on a personal level, which I think is important to sort of say. Well, well you raise a really, really good point because I, I want to, uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit to something in that he categorizes in the book yeah. um, as the context, right? He says, our world has changed so much and he calls it uh, digital Babylon, right? Yeah. And he, he starts talking about it in, 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 in in-depth ways. And I think that's such a, uh, like you said, it's, this is not a scorecard. Uh, it's, it's a, it's an observation of the lay of the land. Um, what did you think about that concept? Um, and what do you, how do you think that we could help people make sense of that, that idea of digital Babylon? Because the world has changed quite a bit, right? Um, and, and, and I think helping people understand that would, would maybe give us a little bit of a, a better understanding of how we're planning to move forward in all of this stuff. Yeah, so, so the way that they talk about digital Babylon in the book is sort of this idea that the, the world is, we live in an accelerated and complex culture um and and he 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 talks about it as that we have phenomenal access but we also have pr profound in it, in it alienation and we also have a bit of a crisis of authority and so by accelerated he means that everything moves faster the news cycles mm -hmm. information the pace of life and the rate of change mm -hmm. and and we're also living in a pretty complex time so everything feels extremely complicated and, and uncertain and i think as a youth leader that was kind of helpful because i think when you when you're talking to our youth you do sense that there's a lot going on there's information coming from every corner and there's a lot of noise you know there's a lot of noise yeah. that sort of um it, it sort of envelops their world and so yeah. I, I think that's it's a tough place for them to be living in um yeah. and and some of the other characteristics that we think our youth are facing and, and to some degree we're all facing um yeah. in this digital babylon is you know Increase, increase social media, which has certainly had an impact um, mm. on all of us in good ways and in bad ways. Um, like we said, there was sort of this instant access to information that we have in our digital Babylon. So, you know, one of the lines in the book that was kind of illuminating for us was kind of like, why would you ever ask your youth leader or your parents a question when you've got Google in your pocket, right? What's the point of having an uncomfortable conversation with me yeah. about something that you're struggling with if you can just open up your phone do it yourself and yeah. so that sort of that sort of world that they're living in that the kids are living in is a bit of a paradox because in some ways that sounds amazing yeah i don't have to talk to andrew about this i don't have to talk about, to jim about this and i certainly don't mm. have to talk to my parents about it i can just look on google but we think that that you know those conversations with people in the church that you trust are so important right yeah. Um, and even in your family. So, and, and I also think there's increased level of, um, of anxiety and depression amongst our youth. That's the kind of world that they're living in and that they're struggling with. And so um, that's certainly something that we've had to grapple with. And another yeah. interesting thing that uh, Carl Nash put me onto that I thought was pretty interesting was a, a, re a Canadian report called renegotiating faith. Mm -hmm. Um and he, the, the report talks about the, that age between 18 and 28 now, where we've sort of delayed adulthood, right? So these days, young kids have this sort of moment where they're going off to school, they have to sort of pursue whatever, a degree or something, or they're trying to figure out what life looks like. And we've sort of pushed adulthood a little bit for later into life. Yeah. And so they're sort of dealing with this moment where they're, they have to figure out their own faith relationships. They have to figure out, do I go to church when I'm at school? 
who do I go with and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's another challenge our young people face that I think we really want to dive into and say like, how do you establish those things later in life? So I think digital Babylon is a, is a crazy place for our kids to be living mm -hmm. in at the moment. And um, I think they're looking for a bit of a signal. Right. And I yeah. think that's what, what our youth group can hopefully provide. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, that's, that's well put. I, I love in the book how he, he basically says, he goes, this, the idea of Babylon is not new, right? It's just yeah. now this is digital and in, in that this is the thing that we have to contend with, but all throughout time in history, um, you know, people who have been striving to follow after Jesus uh, have, have wrestled through their own Babylons and, and this is what we have to. And I think um, my next question to you relates to uh, the content of the book. And I know we're going to spend the next uh, few podcasts fleshing out each one in detail, but um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the concepts that he talks about, what, what it looks like as, as someone in digital Babylon, what are some of those elements? Cause I know he, he kind of lays it out for us. Um, and some of the things that we're really going to be, um, you know, checking into. Yeah. So, so the, the book's kind of neatly organized into five different chapters in which the authors talk about five different characteristics of resilient disi disciples. Mm -hmm. And these people are the 10% we were talking about before. And they're, they, as Christians, they're better able to, um, they're better able to, you know, live in digital Babylon with these five tools sort of at their disposal in their faith life. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one would be an intimate relationship with Jesus. Um, and that's defined pretty simply as clear and religious clutter for closeness with the, for a closeness with and joy with Christ. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the first, that was the first attribute of these resilient disciples. Mm -hmm. The second one was to, de to develop the muscles of cultural discernment. So they define that as taking part in a robust learning community under the authority of the Bible in order mm -hmm. to wisely navigate and accelerate it in complex culture. Uh, number three, which was one that we, we actually felt we do quite well at, at Forest Brook, was forge meaningful and intergenerational relationships. Um, and so that was that he, they define that as being devoted to fellow believers and want to be around, around them and become like them. Yeah. Um, which I think at our church, you know, with things like small group. And then I also think we have some really neat relationships in our church where people of different generation really connect well with each other um and and you know with this podcast theory uh, with this podcast series sorry we're really going to try to show some of those stories where yeah. we have some pretty neat relationships in our church life that we want to celebrate um and then the fourth uh attribute of a, resi a resilient disciple is that they train for vocational di discipleship um they know and they live god's calling for them especially in the area of work and they right size their ambitions to God's purpose for their life. And mm. then finally, a resilient disciple engages in countercultural mission as they live faithfully um, by trusting in God's power and living differently from cultural norms. So those five things in the book, five separate chapters that they go into quite well in depth, and hopefully we can sort of tease more um, in this podcast series are sort of five things as a youth group we really want to strive to cultivate more within our own youth group um and so yeah i really enjoyed sort of having those as a as a guidepost for where we can take take our ministry going forward yeah and you you said something at the start um and uh i i, I certainly hope that if you're watching this and you're you're engaging and interacting with this um that you you don't just see this as a one-way thing where you're intaking all of this stuff we certainly want to invite your input and the conversation around this because we've put significant amount of time conversing. You're, you'll, you're about to meet uh, the other two who actually uh, were part of this foursome reading group um, and, and just trying to wrestle through these, these elements. We want to invite your input as well. So if you're a parent or you're a small group leader or you're just somebody in the church who just doesn't know where to connect but is just wrestling with some of these things, or if you're a youth who is, you know, trying to figure uh, what life with, with God and faith look like, uh, we really, really want to invite you to think about these things. And I think, I think that's, that's an important uh, piece because 
it's not like this is going to be done overnight. This is a, this is a long-term thing. And, and we're looking for as much ways in to each of these elements as possible. And this is something that certainly will take uh, time and commitment for all of us. So I really appreciate that. Um, that. So why don't we bring in the other uh, others who helped uh, read this book together? Uh, we got Leanne, who's just right below me. Leanne has been an, a faithful and incredible small group leader uh, to our youth ministry. Um, I love Leanne's insights. I love Leanne's courage to want to challenge the norms of things. So I'm, I'm really, really excited that she's here to share uh, with us. Uh, to her left, uh, you already heard from, is Andrew. Um, neat story. Andrew was one of the first youth that I had as a pastor coming in. So it ages me a little bit. I was privileged to um, to perform his his uh, wedding to Kirsten um, and and Andrew now is a small group leader and one of our leaders at our youth ministry. So uh, when I think about uh, a resilient disciple, when I think about what this book talks about, Andrew is one of the models of uh, those along the way in that, and uh, it's it's just been a great blessing to kind of see that. And then Rachel up up top, uh, um, Rachel has been like my right hand person uh, and, and good friend. Um, if I have an idea, Rach is usually the one who helps bring this stuff about. And if, uh, and uh, she's just been a great friend and uh, an incredible insight, a person of insight um, to, to youth ministry. In fact, actually, Rach was the one who introduced <clears throat> this book to us. So I'm really, really uh, thankful that, uh, uh, that Rach is, is part of our, our church. Uh, community. So I, I just want to ask you guys, as we kind of look at this segment of, um, you know, of, of interacting with this book, when you read through this book, and when we talked about this, right, um, obviously, there are the five that we, we talked about the digital Babylon, we talked about the five attributes and the five ways of a resilient disciple. Uh, what was one or two of the aha moments um, when you read this? Well, there are definitely a few. Um, one of the ones that I probably find most hopeful is just the reality that young Christians want their life and their faith to intersect in a meaningful way. And um, this probably connects to a couple of the priorities, both to vocational discipleship and to countercultural mission, but they want they want the, the truth they know about Jesus and how he's affected their life personally to actually intersect with the world as they interact with it. And um, I think that's so important right now when there's so much going on in the world around us that needs the uh, reconciliation or the redemptive line of the gospel story, that it's a high priority for young people in our churches to, to bring that with them into the world wherever they happen to be. And I, um, that's a real aha and very hopeful part of this, um, of this data, uh, but more than that of this story that told in this book and um uh, i just think that that's one of the coolest things that you could possibly hear i was really taken with the idea of the resilient identity and um the idea that identity is constantly being made and renegotiated we're like we're always sort of figuring out what parts of our identity are um are most meaningful and they talk a lot about the fact that um, ha having that identity centered in Jesus um, and that that is an active process. That's something that you work on, that you, um, you know, they talked about getting curious about Jesus. And I know amongst the four of us, we talked a lot about how that is a refreshing um, turn a little bit, right? They get really curious about who Jesus is, was, and you know it's what he's doing in the world now and that will drive how you connect your life and meaning to God and Jesus. Um, I liked the quote uh, that the resilient disciples um, they had was Jesus understands what my life is like these days and that would really be what I would want our youth to feel as well. So just cultivating a soft heart for where God is leading them and really getting active in the process of, of who is Jesus to me and what does that mean to who I am? Great. Um, I would say I'm going to actually tie my other two together here, but um, one of my other ones was that 
one of the lines in the book that's captivated me is that we're loved into loving Jesus, meaning we're loved by other people who follow Jesus. And that gives us this example to follow. Um, and the reason that that really resonates with me is that's my story. And um, I don't think I'm unique there. I think that's really all our story that someone in our life, be it a parent or a youth leader or a pastor or a person of influence loved us enough to share Jesus with us. And that that is actually really effective but that it's, you know, it is this um, life on life day. in. one of the other quotes from the book is that disciples are handcrafted one life at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a bit daunting when you're in a church of our size or a church we hope gets bigger someday because there's going to be more people. But it also means that the opportunity is beyond the four of us or, you know, the 20 to 25 leaders who lead our youth on a Tuesday. It's actually an opportunity for all of us to love mm -hmm next generation into loving Jesus. And that really excites me. Um, and the other one also, I would tie really deeply to my own story, which is that we sometimes prepare teens for the world as we'd like it to be versus the world as it is. And I grew up in an era that we read about in a lot of articles now of, of purity culture and a really high standard, this unattainable place that we had to be, uh, to arrive to, to be good for God. Um, and I think we've seen a different narrative over the last couple of years and that there's actually an opportunity to go, here's this thing in culture and it's broken and here's what Jesus says, and then find a way to merge those for kids so that they mm -hmm. actually have the tools they need to enter the world and not be tempted. And, and it sort of removes the fear from it and the, you know, you have to be sound and do this the right mm -hmm. way. And instead invites them to actually deeply understand what that means for their lives and to be to be on that foundation. So those two things actually kind of tie together for me, partly in my own narrative um, and how I've kind of come out of that and seen a different side as I've led youth in, in a different day. Um, I think I'd tie into what Rachel's saying uh, in terms of the intergenerational piece. So the people who are youth leaders and the people who regularly interact with our youth. And then we know, like Andrew said, there's all of those stories that, that I'd be really, really curious to hear about of how youth and people in our community are interacting and learning and growing you know, from each other. But the idea in this book that, uh, that these relationships really, really matter. And we do them well at Forest Brook, I would say, but there's always room for change and and um, some growth there. So uh, what I was really taken with when we think about intergenerational is uh, telling God stories to each other. You know, what is, is God meaningfully doing in my life that is so tangible that I can share with the youth? And then I want to hear what's happening in their life. And so it's got to be a two-way street and I see it really broad. So our community um, finding ways to have really cool, meaningful life, life-on-life life life interactions with our youth um, where they see where, you know, there's trust built, there's wisdom passed both ways. I always think it, sometimes you think, well, the wisdom's only going to come one way. It's only going to come from the adults to me. And that is so not true. I sit in my youth group and I soak it in. I soak in their wisdom and their stories. And I want them to tell me that and trust me enough to do that with me. And I think we've got such a wide community that would, that would be um, just wonderful to make those connections both ways. When you guys were talking, I was thinking about there's so many instances in the book where all four of us sort of felt like we just needed, a, we almost need to create space for things to happen yes. and God will, and God will intervene and, and give us the hand if we're, if we're creating the space for it to happen. Yeah. And so I think, especially with what Leanne was talking about, intergener intergener intergenerational relationships. And Rachel was talking about, you know, it happens one at a time. I think it sounds, some days that will sound super daunting, but it's the, it's the path that's well worth it, you know? And so I think if we can just create those spaces for our church to get to know our youth really well, because I'll be honest, like there was, you know, when, before I was a youth leader, I'd look at them and be like, look, what are these kids doing? They're on their phones, they're blah, 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 blah. And then I get, then I get to be their youth leader and now I really like them, you know? And so I think, I think uh, the more that 
we can all sort of as a church body get in on this and and do it together i think there's so much great opportunity for uh the whole church to be on in on this with us so i just think it's exciting and and hopeful you know upon reading this all of our stuff and spending the time together with this um if there's one thing that you would want youth to know who are watching or listening this listening to this what would it be i would say that this journey is worth stepping into with us mm. i think that was the first thing that came to my heart and my head um so if you are sure where you are if you're not so sure where you are if you're mm. convinced this is not for you <laughs> come with us come with us on this journey um, and I think that bringing alongside our community, you know, Forsbrook community with us and, um, and just letting them know as well, the youth that, that we're going to be, this is an all hands on deck kind of thing. And so even preparing our own youth leaders differently or, um, just equipping them a little bit more, uh, will be part of this process. So everybody's going to be kind of on this together and working really diligently, really, really um, intentionally to have these kind of really amazing things come to fruition. And so we really would like to see you <laughs> hear, have you listened to us, have you watch us and, and hear from you. Yeah, I think I would borrow um, like some Lion King language here of the circle of life. And um, I guess for me, like the generation that's in youth now, like they will lead me one day, you know, and I've been privileged as a young leader in the church to have people who are older than me, let me lead in the places where I'm gifted and where I'm called. And I don't, you know, wonder if that will happen. I know it will. I know that one day I'll sit in a pew where this generation leads me. Mm. And so like, we want you to take us into a brighter and better future for the church. And I believe that God's doing the work in you now to do that. And when I read this book and, and think about our teens becoming resilient disciples, I just get so excited for the day that I can, I'll, I'll never stop serving in the church, but the day that I can take a step back and follow the lead of somebody else who has followed Jesus closely as they've been a young person. And um, it just really, really excites me. And not just that the future, but they're also the church right now. And when I read, yeah. especially about countercultural mission and, um, and um, I'm blanking on, on the discipleship piece, you know, there's something that this generation has caught that we didn't catch as well. And there's yeah. so much, like Leanne said, so much we can learn. I, anytime somebody thought you, being a youth leader was hard, my response was no, it's, it's the best because mm. it forces me to sit and learn every Tuesday yeah. what's actually going on in the world. And so, um, yeah, I do, you're the church now and you're the ones who will lead us in the future. And I can't wait to watch that happen. I, I think the one thing I'd like to, to say to the youth and especially some of my guys, if they're watching is I, I think the one thing that we've realized as a youth group that we could improve on slightly is that we have strong, small groups. And that's mm -hmm. sort of one of the main tenets of our small group and of our youth group. Sorry. And I think it always will be, I think it's such a great format to get into a smaller group of people that you trust, you know, mm -hmm. you can like Leanne said, do life with, but I think part of starting a new vision here means that there'll be a bit more of a, di a diversity of opportunity to engage. So hopefully we have more things that are just there to have a bit of fun. Maybe we have things that are there to meet new people. Maybe there are different events where we're trying to try something a bit different. And if small groups don't work for you, or if mm -hmm. Sunday church doesn't work for you, I think part of our hope is that we cast a bit of a wider net. And if, if some of the stuff that we're doing now that maybe isn't your speed, you don't like sitting in a, in a zoom room and gushing your feelings uh maybe there'll be something for you in our new vision so i think i think that's maybe helpful for people that right now the status quo isn't isn't always the best and hopefully we can do some stuff that is more your speed if we if we're trying to cultivate all five of these things i think that will mean a different approach somewhere that might work better for you and work better for your relationship with jesus than what we're currently doing which makes total sense i didn't i you know 
I probably like playing basketball with my youth leaders more than I like sitting in small groups. So um, when I was your age, so I think that makes a lot of sense, but I think we're trying to find value in all of those things. So hopefully that's hopeful for the youth. Well, let me, let me turn that question uh, just slightly to a different angle and say to the adults and the parents watching this in our community or, and, and surrounding um, what would, uh, what would one thing that you'd want them to uh, think about, um, you know, in terms of uh, this process and these next few podcasts and where youth is headed? I think I would just say right off the bat again, I just always speak from the heart and from the top of my head is that I have, I have two youth in this right now. I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old and I have the same questions and fears that you do. <laughs> I guess I'll start there. <laughs> I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of security and, um, you know, I, I have a lot of faith, but I, I do have questions and I have fears um, and that there's a place uh, for you to grow in this as well and to get, engage in this as well, I guess, because um, this book did a lot for me in understanding um, a framework that I think is important for, for the parents to understand as well as the youth and as well as the leaders and as well as our community. So again, it's like, how many prongs is that? A lot uh, that we need to come together. Um, and we just need to sort of reevaluate sometimes how we listen. We need to be able to understand how we reinforce, what we reinforce is that, that your kids are experiencing in small group, in youth, and how we support the conversations that come up. So if, if we're opening a whole bunch of new opportunities for conversation and ways to come alongside, then I, I, you just, the parents are so important in that piece as well. And, and I'm gonna be trying to do the same with my kids, so. And I, I think I come from a non-parent perspective. And um, one of the things that I would say to adults in the church is you matter in this and everyone matters in this and um, it doesn't matter your age or stage or your marital status or whatever there's actually a place for you in this ecosystem mm -hmm. and one of the great honors of my life because I haven't been able to raise kids of my own yet is that I've got to be part of the raising of other kids through this work that I do in church um, and it's one of the hallmarks of who I am and who I always want to be um, and so it's it's really been a good um safe place for me to have influence and to to get to walk life with kids and when I read this question I thought of I like to express myself with my words and I like to write things and when I finished with my last group of I led two different groups of girls but when I finished with my last mm -hmm. group of girls a couple of years ago here's what I wrote and this is what I would say to the adults in our church multi-generational friendships are one of the hallmarks of my church experience and one of my greatest gifts Find someone who is younger than you, hang up your insecurities about being cool or fun or wise, and just let them into your life. You'll find that you don't have to really know what to do. You just have to be present. And if you are younger, find people who are older than you and don't think of them as a coach or a supervisor or, or as an idol, just find them to be a friend. Um, life together will be the best mentor, teacher and equalizer you'll know. My life is richer, fuller and far more purposeful and enjoyable because some of my friends are in the same age and stage as me and many of them are not. And um, that is my truest heart. This has been one of my greatest gifts in life. And I don't think you have to have anything special. I think you just have to show up. Mm -hmm. And you have to have really cool yeah. um, hand gestures, hand gestures. Like I now know how to do and all the kids like know that I'm on it. Nice. <laughs> My kids really like in, my kids really like inviting me to the video games because I'm always the first one killed. <laughs> so you always that's another opportunity for the old folk is you show up, you you You're get fodder. you get murdered You're first. Cannon fodder. Yes, and and they, none of them have to be the last one, the first one to go. So that's another that's another uh, opportunity for all the old folk at uh, 
Yeah. Or totally. Yeah. You also may need a translator because yeah. actually, sure. you know, yeah. the slang yeah. of my day is not the slang no, of it's gone. Day, but yeah. they'll no, teach you all kinds of things and you'll be much more street smart than you want. Yeah. Mm. That's sure. why you invite Leanne to everything because she's That's just, right. You can say, well, this is old now. This is even she, years ago. Yeah. You could say you're being too salty or something. Yeah. You'll know what that <laughs> means if you come in along with us. Very good. Oh, that's so funny. Andrew, do you have anything to share about that uh, last bit with the adults? Yeah, yeah, I think I would just echo what Leanne and Rachel were saying is that we were hoping to create more opportunities for adults in the church that they don't have to be a youth leader. They don't have to be there every Tuesday night. They don't have to sign up for a big time commitment. We want, we want some places where there's little opportunities. Maybe it's a day, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a car ride you know? So I think looking out for those opportunities and even thinking of them yourself, how can you look for ways to interact with our youth in a way that's creative in a way that's um, a little bit different? I think about my own experience at at Forest Brook and how many people that weren't my youth leaders, but were older Mm -hmm. people in the church that were sort of so pivotal to my own faith relationship. There's dozens. Um, So I think thinking about how you can be that to a young person at our church today. Yeah. Like, I think it, I think it goes so, so far um, in their development. So that investment's huge. Cool. Well, I, I just want to say thank you so much for, uh, you know, having this conversation. And I know it's just a small uh, taste of the amount of time that we actually uh, spent wrestling with this. I want to I wanna leave us with this. And we've read this, Rach, and a bunch of you guys actually referred to it. Um, this, I think, is, is something that has contextualized this process for me and actually excited me quite a bit. Um, it's what he explains about a uh, disciple. And he says this, in digital Babylon, faithful and resilient disciples are handcrafted one life at a time. And I think uh, coupled with what Uh, Andrew shared earlier that, you know, and and actually a bunch of you guys shared that we do small groups really well. And, um, and this is an opportunity for us to hone in on that. And then some, and for us to look at uh, not just one way of doing discipleship in this just really changed landscape, but that there would be multiple ways in, in so many different ways and that we would be versatile in, in how we approach uh, that and I, and I appreciate what you guys were sharing um, in terms of that wrestling with the questions, youth, wherever they are. I appreciated the invite, uh, Leanne, that you kind of gave uh, earlier. And to you watching and listening, I, I want to invite you on this journey because uh, it, it will hopefully give you an insight into the heart that we've been challenged with, that, that because we live in a different time, uh, the call of Jesus to disciple uh, this generation is still there. And, and we have to use our head and our heart and the, the power of the Holy Spirit to, to really move forward in this. And we really think that this is an incredible journey forward. And so we want to make this a conversation. Uh, we don't want to just make this something where you receive from us. Um, and so as you do listen, as you do process, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll we'll make the uh, comments available in the description below. So you feel free to write us. Uh, we'll leave some information on how you can reach us uh, to have this conversation if you'd like. But we would really love to hear from you because we don't want this to be a static one-way thing because um, we do believe that we have some incredible resources in terms of people whose hearts have been changed and touched by God. And so we want to hear from you uh, in that regard. Um, We've got a few more episodes coming up, five to be exact, in which each individual episode we'll be breaking down uh, what we've learned uh, with those five ways that he's put out as as far as characteristics of what a resilient disciple looks like. And so we really hope you could join us um, in in those uh, as we as we look to that. Um, Andrew, do you have anything final to say? About yeah, this? no, I think I think tuning in to the next five will be really fun. You're going to meet some of the some of the youth in our in our youth group that I think that will be really interesting to you know you'll get to hear a bit of their story and get to know them in sort of this odd digital space and then when you see them when we're all back in church you can go say hello and uh, tell them what you thought I also secured the mascot of our youth group for a podcast guest if you want in the comments below you guys can venture a guess who that mascot might be 
but he or she has agreed to come on. So That's that good. will be exciting. That's and uh, I'm sure they'll deliver. You'll have to stay tuned for that one. So you'll have to stay tuned. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here and sharing your thoughts and your heart. Really appreciate this. And to you tuning in and listening, uh, thank you so much for joining us in this, uh, um, you know, this experiment. And we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, and most of all, we look forward to what God's going to do uh, with all these processes. So thank you so much. <laughs>